Hello everyone and welcome to The Vortex, where lies and falsehoods are trapped and exposed. I'm Michael Voris. Church Milton has posted an article on our website we suggest you read when you're able. Just click on the link. It's about Theodore McCarrick's young years in high school, specifically in New York City at Xavier High School, which was back in the day and still is a very prestigious school. Church Milton has obtained multiple photos of McCarrick in his freshman and sophomore years at Xavier High, and what they show is a stellar student involved in virtually everything, excelling in the debate club, the yearbook, the editorial staff, you name it. It's a very telling article. Please take a couple of minutes again to read it, but not just for idle curiosity. The photos point to something sinister already at play all the way back then. McCarrick did not graduate from Xavier. He just suddenly was no longer a student there. Then after many months that are unaccounted for, he suddenly reemerged as a student at Fordham Prep, another highly prestigious high school then and now. So all of that leaves us with two questions. One, why did he suddenly depart Xavier? And two, how did he enroll in Fordham Prep? The first question is especially intriguing because someone is lying about the answer. McCarrick, in interviews a number of years ago, claims he was expelled for being a bad student, an overall ne'er-do-well. In contacting Xavier High, we were told he was not expelled. Judging from the photos tracing his couple of years at Xavier, McCarrick appear appears to be the very opposite of a student heading for expulsion. In fact, he appears to be on his way to be voted most likely to succeed and be student body president. Yet, he claims he was expelled. The answer to that question appears as though it will remain a mystery, but it sure seems hard to believe he was expelled, at least for being a bad student. Something else, perhaps, but not that. The second question is, how did he get into Fordham Prep? Catholic schools even today, but especially very prestigious ones, did not just enroll anyone, especially if they'd been expelled from a rival school of prestige. So, how did McCarrick get into Fordham Prep? That's the second question. And it's not just an academic curiosity. It's not because from what Church Milton has been able to piece together, it seems as though the young student during those roughly six months or so he was not in either school somehow entered into the circle of Cardinal Francis Spellman. Whether directly or indirectly, various people we've spoken to have suggested McCarrick somehow fell under Spellman's influence during this time. The story also seems to have some merit because Spellman had a very friendly relationship with Fordham Prep, and a phone call from the Cardinal or his staff would have immediately tossed aside any concerns about McCarrick's abrupt departure from Xavier. Spellman is a figure who looms large on the landscape of the church in America. Multiple rumors for decades have swirled around the question of him being homosexual and carrying on with young Broadway entertainers. That's just one sample. Likewise, two years ago in an article in Salon, a man who at the time was a West Point cadet says he was groped by Spellman in his office while conducting an interview for the Academy newspaper. A Monsignor, who was present, kept intervening, but the young cadet, who was accompanied by another cadet, says, looking back, he now knows what was going on. And here's the interesting point of this about Spellman. He was known for his, dare we say, rigid orthodoxy. And because of that, and the times, the 40s and 50s and the 60s, no one would even be willing to consider that a powerful orthodox archbishop was also, at the same time, a practicing homosexual. But that was 1967. Fast forward a half century, and we're all very willing to more than believe that because we know it to be a fact. A prime example, of course, being McCarrick himself, who Spellman ordained to the priesthood approximately 10 years after those missing months between Xavier and Fordham Prep. But how could a strong, orthodox, high-ranking prelate also be a pervert. 
That's a point many Catholics still can't get into their head. Spellman, after all, was a ferocious defender of the church and the faith. Well, the answer is in a very small word, dot, D-O-T. It's an inside baseball expression for a cleric who loves the lace and the pageantry and tradition and the candles and the incense and the bells and the drama of the liturgy and all of that, but is also a homosexual. Dot, D-O-T, stands for Daughter of Trent. On the outside, he's all about the church, but there's another side deeply conflicted with the exterior where he's also homosexual. Many lay Catholics make the mistake of over oversimplifying this whole homosexual clergy thing. They're too quick to say, if Bishop such and such is orthodox, then he's not gay. Likewise, if Bishop such and such is liberal, then he must be gay. While in very large strokes, there's likely some truth to that, to simply move on the assumption that if a priest or bishop is a fan of the Latin Mass and preaches orthodoxy, then everything's okay, that would be a mistake. Dots are deeply conflicted. They compartmentalize a lot. Unlike their heterodox gay bishop brothers, they would never say anything to deliberately undermine the faith. Quite the opposite. They would defend it to the death. But interiorly, there's an entirely different dynamic at play. They are sympathetic to the whole gay thing going on in the church. They made friends in their seminary days with other gay men. Most remained just parish priests, those who stayed. Some left and got gay married. Others remained closeted and carrying on homosexual affairs, some of them on grinder. Some raped altar boys. And some got promoted to bishop while also being homosexual and oftentimes active. Some gave up being active, but have remained sympathetic to their gay comrades in mitres, telling themselves that as long as minors aren't involved, well, it's not really that bad. The hierarchy is drowning in an acceptance of sodomy. Those who are sympathetic, for whatever reason, give a pass to gay men. They cover for them, make up excuses for them, promote them, protect them, socialize with them, even purchase property with them. And the deep interior conflict these men experience prevents them from defending the faith entirely. When it comes to areas of sexual morality, they fall silent. They get what Cardinal Timothy Dolan of New York described as laryngitis on those topics, something he himself suffers from. McCarrick is the showpiece example of all this, but he certainly was and is not the only case. His pedigree stretches back to Spellman, who despite the outward orthodoxy, has many gay questions swirling around him. Spellman greatly favored McCarrick with various assignments, putting his seal of approval on him. After graduation from Fordham Prep, McCarrick traveled to Switzerland with the well-to-do Grine family, who he had become friendly with during his last two years of high school. When the family returned to the States, he remained in the family's hometown in Switzerland, St. Gallen. How a poor kid from New York managed to provide for himself in a foreign country in the immediate math aftermath of World War II is another mystery, at least formally. In research a number of years back in the aftermath of the Summer of Shame, Church Militant discovered St. Gallen was one of over 30 locations in Western Europe where the Soviets had set up a communist indoctrination center in their effort to undermine the West. The young McCarrick stayed at St. Gallum without any visible means of support for almost a year, but when he returned to New York, he enrolled in seminary under Cardinal Spellman and was ordained in 1958 by a cardinal who was likely homosexual and perhaps who he had some kind of relationship with or knowledge of prior to that. McCarrick went on to be the most prolific, that is, of, that we know of, homo predator in the church, often sounding very orthodox, yet undermining the faith at every turn, very possibly as a communist-trained agent. He returned every year to St. Gallen for many years. Until there is a move, a very public move, to rid this particular evil from the church, every bishop is suspect, without exception, orthodox or heterodox. 
They refuse to acknowledge it as the omnipresent influence it is even in their own ranks. They lie about it being the root of the sex, sex abuse scandal. They will not breathe a word about it under any circumstances. Some of them, orthodox ones, will freely admit privately they know other bishops who are gay, and they're fine with it. Whoever the demon is that controls this wicked vice, that demon has a stranglehold on the U.S. hierarchy. And it doesn't matter if the bishop is a liberal or a dot. They're all under that demon's influence. God love you. I'm Michael Voris.